colleagues for this conference. Hello everyone, my name is Shane Hines. I'm a third year medical student at the CUNY School of Medicine. I'm the other co-lead for this conference. Oh, sorry, sorry. so before giving our little um, spiel, um, we wanted to start off um, with just like a couple of logistic things. So if everyone could make sure that their Zoom name is their first and last name, um, as you wrote it in your registration, it'll just be really helpful for the breakout sessions um, to be able to do that smoothly. If you don't know how to change your name, you can go to participants and then hover over your name. Um, you click on more and then um, it should give you the option to rename yourself. Um, so the second order of business is that um, the hashtag for the conference um, this year is AIMMED2020. I'll put that in the chat box um, later. So feel free to use it um, if you guys end up uh, tweeting or you're on social media. Um, and then throughout the day, um, there's going to be poll questions popping up on your screen. If they're optional, but if you don't mind um, filling them out, it would be really helpful for us um, to make sure the conference is even better um, next year. And then if you have any technical issues, um, feel free to private message us, um, either Shane or I. So with all that out of the way, um, we wanted to welcome you guys uh, to the third annual Advocacy Medicine Conference. So as many of you guys may know and as some of you guys may not know um, the first iteration of the conference came to be due to a group of medical students who are really dedicated um, in wanting to learn how to better serve and advocate for their patients so these students um, and all the students following the first group of students recognize uh, the role that health professional students can play um, in bettering the lives of their patients in informing health policy and just um, generally creating a more healthy and, and equitable and sustainable society. Thanks, Marcia. Um, as we know, the look and feel of this year's conference, just like many things in 2020, are a lot different. And this is a testament of just one of the many ways we've had to adapt to what we call the next normal. Currently, the official death toll of the pandemic is at roughly 210,000 individuals in the United States. And we're expecting to see at least another 100,000 lives taken before the end of the year. Coincidentally, today is the National Day of COVID-19 Remembrance. And that to commemorate the many lives lost. And in memoriam, we'd like to take a moment and recognize those who have lost their lives in this pandemic, as well as the grief faced by their families. Please join us in a brief moment of silence before continuing. Thank you. And although the conference is US focused, we must keep in mind that this is a global crisis that requires all of us to work together to eradicate. In a time where the basis, basics of science and rational reasoning are questioned and politicized, now is more important than ever for us to shift the medical community towards fully engaging in the role of being a health advocate. Extending our activities beyond the individual agencies our patients, of our patients and begin acting more in the role of health activists. As a third year medical student myself, I can say to my fellow young health professionals, now is the time for us to reshape healthcare as we shape our careers. So moving towards our, the run through for the conference of the day, we're gonna start off our morning with an invigorating keynote from Dr. Sanjeev Saram. This will be followed by a panel discussion featuring our amazing lineup of speakers. And in the afternoon, we'll continue with our breakout sessions, followed by our, our breakout sessions where everyone has been assigned to one workshop based on the preferences selected at registration. And we'll close off the day with our second keynote speech by Dr. Joa Mukherjee, um, as well as our networking hour. Um, so we just wanted to close off by thanking everyone who made this uh, conference possible. So thank you to the Advocacy and Medicine Committee members. Um, and these, um, and this is um, Stephanie, Alexandra, Millie, Alex, um, Amanda, Jason, Anne, Paige, and Kelsey. Um, we also want to thank in advance all of our speakers, panelists, and facilitators for making this conference possible. This conference is hosted in partnership with the New York Academy of Medicine, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, 
Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. We'd like to give a special thank you to Dr. Bill Jordan from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for his continued support and guidance. At NIAM, we would like to thank Dr. Judy Salerno, Laura Pronovos, Donna Fingerhunt, Gina Ravosa, and Michael Canfora, and Joey Harper for all their, their behind the scenes work and continued support making our conference this year, year possible and as well as all our previous conferences. Lastly, a thank you to our sponsor, the CUNY School of Medicine. Um, so now we're going to pass over the like metaphorical stage um, to Dr. Judy Salerno, president of the New York Academy of Medicine, um, a real champion for health equity and one of um, our biggest supporters. Thank you, Thank you Shane and, and Marcia. It's, it's really been a great privilege to work with you on um, AIM over the last three years. And um, I know that you have put your heart and soul into making a very successful AIM conference this year. And no doubt uh, there were in incredible challenges as we um, endured this pandemic over the last eight months. But you were so proud of you and the planning committee and your flexibility and, and foresight that really um, have contributed to making this what I know will be an extremely successful and dynamic virtual experience. Um, so um, here's to uh, an exciting and important day ahead. So let me officially welcome everyone to the conference and um, say good morning. And I know um, getting up on a Sunday morning when you don't have to is um, uh, a mark of your commitment to, um, to, to advocacy in medicine and what this conference represents. This is our third annual event um, and our first virtual one. So I'm, it's really encouraging to see so many of you who are participating as advocates for health. And you are representatives of the future of healthcare. You give me great hope when I look out over your um, little one inch squares um, on Zoom. Um, and I know who's behind that, people who really care. For the last eight months, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the lives of millions of Americans and highlighted the consequences of the deep inequities in our healthcare system. So now more than ever, we need advocates for patients as well as our frontline uh, advocates for our frontline healthcare providers to advance health equity. On a personal note, um, at the height of the pandemic in New York City, I volunteered at Bellevue Hospital um, for uh, about five weeks uh, full time. And um, I worked shoulder to shoulder with medical students and house staff. And I was, um, despite being brought down by the scourge of this pandemic, um, every day I left with um, some optimism in my heart because I saw what you, the young professionals in healthcare could do. And it was really incredibly inspiring. Um, so you're here because you understand that we cannot achieve health equity without doing our part on uh, advocating on behalf of our patients, especially on matters of social justice. And this, because um, in the last few months, this has never been more um, exposed uh, on display in our healthcare system. It's made us painfully aware of what we've known for a long time, and that's that the impact um, of systemic racism on the health of our communities. COVID-19, as you know, has had a disproportionate effect on Black and Hispanic communities. And this is an injustice that um, we all have to strive to rectify. And all of this is compounded by the outcries of the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the grievous injury of, of Jacob Blake. Blake um, so the national uh, outcry for racial justice and meaningful change is amplified and your voices are amplified in this fight. At NIAM, we're committed to dismantling systemic racism 
as we seek to eliminate barriers that prevent every individual from living a healthy life. And I'm proud to know that you are joining us and are equally committed, if not more, because this is your life and the beginning of your career to that same goal. In your roles as physicians, nurses, public health leaders, you see and will continue to see how social conditions impact the health and well being of your patients. You'll be challenged to find ways that your commitment to activism, empathy, and compassion can work to ameliorate suffering because that's where real healing begins. And you are going to be a part of that healing. And as I said, every single year at this conference now, that it's a privileged role that you have as healthcare providers, and you'll be a respected voice. And as I always also say, that um, you must speak up and speak out wherever you see injustice so that everyone can have a fair chance at living a healthy life. This is not standing back and standing by. You are the voice of healthcare and the future of the health and well being of our communities. The AIM conference was conceived by and continues to be led by an inspired, inspiring, and dedicated um, student planning committee. Um, and I'd like to, too, recognize the entire committee um, for their very hard work and putting together a really special program. So thank you for your commitment. I'd like to also organize, uh, acknowledge our organizing partner, the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And from the inception of AIM, Dr. Bill Jordan has represented this partnership. And as always, we're so grateful for this collaboration. Together, we're so pleased that we can provide a platform for the next generation of health providers. And I'd also like to uh, give special thanks to the Arnold P. Gold Foundation for their generous and continue, continuing support of um, AIMS activity. This year, they committed to um, bringing some of the resources that we had at the academy into the AIM community. The foundation is dedicated to humanism and healthcare and to create educating and connecting future healthcare leaders and sustaining a student alliance uh, to organize health professionals to bring around about uh, positive change. And of course, uh, thank you to CUNY School of Medicine uh, for their support of this conference, which helped make this program possible. We hope today's work is uh, a beginning for many of you as you learn ways to advocate for critical health issues and for the individuals and communities you care so deeply about. Thank you for your willingness to challenge the systems and structures that stand in the way of a healthy life for all. You're here today because you care, and that is the cornerstone of becoming a compassionate and exceptional health professional. So I am looking at the future of our healthcare system and couldn't be more excited. And I hope that this will be the first of, uh, for many of you, but not the last of experiences here that we've been able to um, provide at NIAM where we're dedicated to breaking down barriers for health uh, to all. Um, and last year we formally announced that advocacy and medicine would be a work group at um, the New York Academy of Medicine. And we will continue to make this our, the home, not only for the annual conference, but for additional events that you will plan in the future. So if you're not already a student member of NIAM, please visit NIAM.org and um, find out how you can apply and join Shane and Marcia and other student members who are dedicated to advancing health equity with ongoing support from NIAM. Uh, the Department of Health and the Gold Foundation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Allie Greenberg, one of our student organizers, to introduce our keynote speaker. Have a great day. Thank you so much. 
My name is Allie Greenberg. I'm one of the organizers from SUNY Downstate Medical School, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. He's the former national surrogate for the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign, and at Social Security Works, he leads a campaign called All Means All, dedicated to making racial equity a cornerstone of Medicare for All. As Dr. America, Dr. Sriram has created media on health policy and equity and racial justice. Dr. Sriram completed his medical degree in residency at UCLA and earned his master's in public health through the Commonwealth Fund at the Harvard School of Public Health. He practices general pediatrics in Southeast Washington, DC, and he is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Sriram, please go ahead. Thank you for that welcome, and I'm really honored to be part of this conference. And I, I love seeing so many uh, familiar faces, like Bill and Steve, and uh, and I saw Kamini's name, and I see Augie there, and it's just great to to be in such excellent company and um, and and to be part of this uh, amazing conference. I'm I'm very excited for this morning. So let me try to share my screen and. Make sure I do this the right way. Okay, can everybody see what I'm sharing? Are we all good? Okay. Okay, great. So um, what I wanted to talk about was sort of um, what I have learned along the course of becoming a physician activist, what were some of the milestones that pushed me, um, what lessons I learned from those milestones, and then the actions that I took at the time and continue to take um, as a physician activist. I'm going to try my best to go as quickly as I can. Um, a PDF of these slides will be made available to whoever would like them. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to keep this moving as quickly as we can so that I can take questions. And let's see, there we go. Okay, I have no financial conflicts of interest because most advocacy work is not exactly uh, a profit maker, but just for the sake of professionalism, I'm going to say I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, again, I'm going to be running through some milestones, the lessons that I've learned from them, and the actions that I take uh, from, um, from those lessons. So I would say my biggest awakening as an activist was the 2000 election. Um, as many of you know, uh, Bush v. Gore was, um, was ridiculously close. There was a ton of con controversy over voting rights. But, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I learned from this election is that this level of closeness in an election happens hundreds, if not thousands of times across the country when it comes to mayors, city councils, governors, state legislatures, ballot initiatives. Um, voting is one of those uh, most important elements of civic engagement that we need to all participate in, not just every four years, but every single opportunity that you get. And uh, um, one of my um, colleagues, Dave Grandy, um, did a, you know, a survey of physician voting behavior between, uh, this was a 2007 study that he did and looked at physician voting behavior between 1996 and 2002. And you know, the, the physician uh, community um, does not vote in nearly the um, levels that we ought to. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, more recent data to see whether this has improved um, since the um, early 2000s. But uh, regardless, the fact still remains that voting impacts um, so much of, uh, of the realities and lived lives of our patients. And it's something that all of us need to be participating in um, much more often than, than we do. And at more levels than just the national level. Um, you know, another element, and so the, the 2000 election happened while I was still a medical student. The, another thing that um, I committed myself to as a student was to make time for education outside of healthcare. I know that um, as students, um, and even as, you know, as working professionals now, um, it, is, it is hard to find time for outside reading, but I have to say that 
a lot of the reading that I did outside of my uh, required curriculum actually informed so much more of the care that I gave to patients than uh, what I was learning in, in lab and um, in the traditional classroom. Uh, this is just a sampling of, of things that I read. As you can see, there's um, a mix of fiction and nonfiction. Um, there's different writing styles. There's um, books that maybe I would not recommend um, as, you know, as strongly as I used to. There's books that I highly recommend and more forcefully recommend than I did before. Um, but what I would really recommend to folks is to just talk to your friends and family and influencers about what are they reading right now? What really just, I mean, blew them away? What, um, you know, brought them to tears? What filled them with, with anything, joy, anger, um, frustration, and, um, and make time to read it and, you know, keep it close and reflect on it as, as a provider. Um, one of the most important books that I've ever read and I, I keep coming back to is A People's History of the United States. And one of the quintessential lessons that I've learned about this book is that you cannot underestimate the value of your own voice and that you by no means have to be perfect or powerful to, um, to contribute. And that many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of people who are pretty imperfect, have risked a lot more than you and I ever will, and with very few odds of success um, to bring us to the place that we are uh, right here, right now. And, you know, playing it safe um, is, I, I've come to respect it as a survival strategy that is necessary for people to just make it to the next day and in and of, and survival in and of itself is a, is an audacious act um, and um, it is an act of resistance, but ultimately in the long run, um, surviving is simply not enough if we want to truly thrive. Um, the, uh, and then, um, you know, one of my uh, favorite quotes from this book among many, many, many uh, quotes is that, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. From, um, you know, as a resident, I participate a lot in my local uh, American Academy of Pediatrics chapter. And it was because, as I, was, as I mentioned before, ballot initiatives, especially in a state like California, are decided by very narrow margins. And many people choose not to participate because they simply do not know uh, what the ballot initiatives mean, um, you know, how, what is the right direction to vote in. And so for the sake of uh, my colleagues, um, a group of us organized in our local AAP chapter to make voting guides that would help, um, and it would just make, answer the question of how would a public health minded pediatrician vote on such and such ballot initiative? And where there was no um, public health um, aspect, we. Uh, we entered no comment just out of uh, full honesty and, um, and integrity to this process. But there were many things that involved uh, first responders, that involved environmental health, that involved economic justice, that ballot initiatives do have an impact on parents and patients. And so it was, uh, it was a real important foray into uh, policy at a very local level, getting to know um, my fellow residents and, um, and then producing something that was useful to uh, voting behavior um, in, in our profession. Um, from there, I um, decided to volunteer um, in Congressman Waxman's office. He was my congressman at the time, and he was chairman of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. And for the time that I was in his office in the late spring of 2007, um, the work involved subpoenaing uh, the, um, some large pharmaceutical corporations to get to the bottom of some questions about whether their marketing had misinformed patients and, uh, and prescribers about uh, the safety and efficacy of the medications. And the way that Big Pharma responds to these kinds of subpoenas is that they just do a document dump. They figure that if we flood your, your piddly little office with hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper, you will get so lost in the haystack that you will never find the needle and you can never accuse us of not answering the subpoena. 
And so when you have, and so his team had a few physicians who were civic minded and it didn't require any kind of special knowledge, you know, like you just needed to know how to quickly go through documents and say, this is nonsense, this is nonsense, nonsense. Oh, this might be something. And I would take this to my legislative aide who I was working under and say, I don't know if this is going to answer the questions that the congressman is looking for, but I thought that you should hold on to this one. And my, and my supervisor would say, that's great, keep going. And it, we would just keep identifying the suspicious pieces out of this entire document dump. And there's no glamor in any of that work, it's a total grind, but it is a huge part of making an office like this function and holding power accountable. Um, and it is a way to learn a lot about the, uh, the processes of government from a level that does not require a ton of experience or knowledge, but does require a commitment to um, civic engagement. Um, from, uh, from residency, I um, went on to pursue a, an, a master's in public health through the Commonwealth Fund at the, um, the Harvard School of Public Health. And I have to say that what I got most, more out of anything from this experience was learning to read a political climate and then strategize accordingly for making advocacy most impactful. And to recognize how academia and think tanks and medical experts are used, how they are not used, and how they can be either manipulated or they can actually contribute to policy making and advocacy in a meaningful way. Um, I think that it sharpened a sense of radar and um, and and tactic that I've uh, that I continue to use um, to this day. Uh, in 2009, I, after graduating, I um, moved to DC and um, worked with, uh, with people like Bill at the National Physicians Alliance uh, to do a lot of communications work and to uh, promote as many progressive provisions in the Affordable Care Act as we possibly could. Um, working in coalitions with, uh, with unions and, and community organizations and faith groups, it showed the power of working in those coalitions, knowing where a white coat would be of value and a meaningful contribution, and to know the difference between when should you speak and when should you stand back and let somebody else, you know, take the spotlight and back them up. Um, that became a very powerful lesson um, in the experience of actually doing it. And in the course of, uh, of following more experienced organizers, you learn how to navigate the hill and amplify um, each other's voices in meaningful and powerful ways. Uh, the ACA one, I decided I wanted to get back into uh, some more clinical work. And so I got involved with a variety of causes um, as I was a full-time clinician and really um, spent a lot of time with the ACA as far as like helping colleagues, you know, uh, navigate misinformation about it, but also um, participating in causes like immigration rights and um, preventing gun violence. Um, I learned more and more about my strengths as a writer and became an, a regular contributor to the Huffington Post and um, a variety of other uh, periodicals and learn the value of um, bringing public health and academic speak to the public square. And these are all titles that none of them would really be the kind of thing that you would want published in a medical journal, but they are the ways that people connected with, you know, with a lot of material that would be otherwise very difficult to understand and access. Um, you know, things like, you know, the safety of vaccines, the efficacy uh, of public health against gun violence, the value of Medicaid, um, you know, how to make sense of prescription drugs and what doctors feel about it. Um, these were all a variety of topics that I felt uh, needed that had a lot of academic knowledge and a lot of white papers have been written you know, about all of these topics, but a lot of that material had never made it into the public square where it could shift and contribute to opinion and how people thought and viewed these issues. Um, from there, I, I decided that I wanted to do more advocacy that 
was not quite to the in the tradition of academia. Um, and so I reconnected with a lot of um, my activist friends, one of whom uh, owned a radio station. And when I said I'd like to help the anchor, the news anchors uh, in their stories about health policy, he said that you should just do the show yourself. And that's how Dr. America was born. Um, I had no experience in radio, but he said that, you know, stupid people do it all the time and you're not stupid, so just do it. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I learned a lot by just doing it again and again and again and learned um, how to navigate the world of social media, create content that, um, you know, that generated interest and maintained an audience. And uh, in the course of doing a lot of this, I learned that I needed to maintain a firewall between my activism and my clinical work. And so it, I joked around, but it was very serious that I had a very uh, Bruce Wayne, Batman, or Miles Morales, Spider-Man approach to how I did this, that like in my place of work, I didn't bring any of this to um, my workplace. And, you know, some would say that maybe that's a detriment, you know, to organizing. I felt that it was important to my surviving in my workplace and not um, jeopardizing my standing with my employer. Um, and, and then it also allowed me to have greater freedom in the integrity of my voice when I could turn around in my activist community and say that I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer, but I'm happy to bring my white coat to, um, to these movements and causes. Um, my work has continued. I've, uh, I've really tightened my focus to uh, Medicare for All and racial equity. Um, through my work with uh, Social Security Works and ACT TV. Um, the All Means All campaign has been um, a fantastic opportunity to kind of build a campaign on my own um, with uh, racial equity being a focus. And I think that it has been a, con a major contribution to the Medicare for All movement simply because uh, traditionally that movement has been largely white and the country is moving in a direction of being um, dominated by people of color, um, many of whom don't feel a place of uh, belonging or identity with Medicare for All, and our campaign means to rectify that. Um, it's been a privilege to meet so many you know, fascinating people uh, you know, in, um, in the course of this work, um, and, you know, and to really build my own voice and maintain it is sense of integrity as, uh, as a physician activist. Um, what my recommendations to, you know, this group is that you find your strengths and deploy them with excellence and passion. That you challenge comfort zones in yourself and among your colleagues and peers. And, you know, in doing that, it's risky. You, you know, there are times when you might feel like you're alone, but that's also where the communities like this are, are, are tremendously important to reach out to so that you are not feeling like you're um, some pariah in your local um, network. Um, I think that um, learning, you know, unconventional wisdom and using that in, uh, in, in ways that challenge, again, those comfort zones is enormously powerful. Um, you must definitely support each other with more than just lip service. And um, I feel that the more that you are changing the things that you cannot accept, rather than just accepting the things you know, that you cannot change, I think that that dynamic is, a, is an important piece to build into your work ethic um, in patient care and in your advocacy. Um, I hope that there's still some time for questions, but I really do appreciate this opportunity to speak with all of you. And I'm excited for, um, for this uh, amazing group of rising clinicians. I'm proud to, you know, to call you my colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, we can do five minutes of questions. Um, if people don't have questions, they can go on break for five minutes. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. So I had a question. Um, how are you able to like manage to do all of this while concurrently being like at 
it seems like you're able to do all these things at different stages in your training. And I think one of the biggest challenges as a student is like how to juggle all those things. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I can tell you that during my ICU rotations, um, advocacy took a backseat to everything. I, um, it, when I was not in the ICU, I was eating and sleeping. I, you know, um, you know, I really um, had to find opportunities to um, prioritize uh, self care and um, and my other relationships. I mean, now I'm you know, a father of a of a three year old daughter, and you know, when you have, and I mean, I think that all of the stages of life, you know, having a, a marriage and a mortgage changes how you strategize, you know, what you do advocacy wise. Um, I had to make some choices about, you know, about not participating in things, um, you know, pulling back from uh, being an activist in gun violence, um, you know, came as a kind of disappointment to some people, but it was also, you know, a lot of folks were very understanding of it. And I think that, you know, understanding what your, um, what your limitations are, what your constraints are in terms of time, stamina, um, you know, bandwidth, I think that you will find that you are better able to serve the causes that you are participating in when you are um, true to your own strengths, to your own interests, and to your own capabilities. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with not being everything to everyone. Thank you. I also think there's a couple questions in the chat. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Um, okay, I see one of the questions is, do you know where we can find voter guides in other states? Yeah, that's a good question. And honestly, um, local organizations do a fantastic job these days. Um, I think uh, between Indivisible, Our Revolution, um, a lot of immigration rights groups have um, really good voter guides. Uh, unions have good voter guides. Um, and so it does require kind of knowing who your local organizations are, and they tend to have very good um, voter guides for your local elections. Um, okay, how would you address friends or family who refuse to vote this year? Um, you know, if you have the ability to vote and you're still choosing not to, it's hard. I would say that there have to there has to be elements of the ballot that are motivating um, beyond the choice for president. There are things that I think a lot of people don't know that on that ballot are are much more than just the the choice between Biden versus Trump. There are things about your local board of education. There are, you know, ballot initiatives, um, your city council. There are circuit judges. There are so many other um, things that are being determined on that ballot that even if you are still not motivated to participate in the presidential election, which I disagree with personally, but I would say that your local community still benefits from your participation on many, many local issues um, that will impact your day-to-day -day life, whether you choose to participate or not. Um, okay, can you speak to what jeopardizes your relationship with your employer when doing advocacy work? Oh yeah, this is, okay. Um, okay, I'll give you guys an example. Um, so in DC, there was a um, there there was a policy about paid family or paid medical leave um, that, as all of us know, in medical and public health circles, you know, um, paid leave is critical to how our patients recover, how our caregivers um, help our patients. Um, it's, it's got enormous public health impact and it benefits people uh, medically and economically to have paid leave. Um, the, the hospital I work for disagreed with the policy on some technical points on, some, on how it was doing its funding and who it was requiring to um, offer paid leave to. I disagreed with my employer and I chose to work with coalitions that were pushing for paid leave in DC. In doing that, I had to be very clear that I did not represent my hospital and I had to be also very clear to my hospital that I'm not going to, you know, badmouth them. So it was a very, you know, 
careful thread to uh, needle to thread um, in knowing, you know, like how my coalition partners identified me. Like if they are introduced to me as like, oh, this is Dr. Sriram who works for such and such hospital. It's like, okay, that's problematic because you don't want to necessarily connect me to that organization. Um, and at the same time, I needed my organization to know that I'm not there, you know, like, I mean, you know, poisoning their reputation. And so knowing how to speak directly to the policy, the benefit to patients, you know, what does public health say about, you know, um, about paid medical leave? Um, it really did require some skill in sharpening my focus, knowing what I could say and what I could not say. Uh, being obviously careful about, I mean, for years now, I've never had a white coat with my employer's emblem on it. Um, but those kinds of things really do require that you know, um, and even when reporters want to come and talk to me at a rally or something like that, and they ask, you know, uh, what hospital did you work for? I make it very clear to them that I'm a pediatrician in Southeast Washington, D.C., and I would prefer not to have my employer identified. And Reporters are enormously respectful of that when you are cognizant of it and are very clear and specific about it. Um, so knowing how to navigate that, I think, is an important skill set. Um, it also does require that you not show up the next day at your workplace and be, you know, like, I mean, this is like the Bruce Wayne Batman thing. Bruce Wayne doesn't show up at Wayne Industries and be like, you know, guess what I did last night? It's like, you know, you have to kind of like, know um, who you trust with your work and who you do not and why. Um, and I think that it's a skill set that um, comes with practice and it's important to have a community whom you can trust that information with. But um, it does, I, I think, require a very, very careful and, and conscious and deliberate um, approach to activism. Uh, let's see. Let me try to look at the chat for more questions. Okay. Can you speak a little bit more about the firewall? Well, okay. Yeah, I think I just spoke a little bit about that firewall, especially in the context of those of us who have several rounds of applications. Yeah. Residency fellowship ahead of us where we might be concerned about being as outspoken as we might otherwise be. Yeah. Um, this is where community matters. And I think that uh, especially as those of us who are your attendings in this, I really want, um, and I keep pushing this at conferences whenever students you know, present amazing work, I'm one of those people who ask the audience of the older generations of, of providers in the room, can we back up these students and residents with letters of rec when it's time to make those phone calls for fellowship? Are we gonna be the ones who, are, who know I know that program director. I know that you know who runs that fellowship over there. I'm going to put in a phone call for you know this person. Um, that's how like you know that is what we as the older generation of advocates owe to younger generations, so that you are not left out there hanging, um, being patted on the back for doing risky work, but then suffering consequences. You know in your in your professional life. That's you know. I think that that is, um, that is the difference between a community that is cosmetic versus kinetic. That, you know, this is where we, uh, you know, assert our influence is to really say to, uh, to your future employers that this is actually the most professional of, it, when it comes to professionalism, this is what professionalism looks like, you know. Um, and that's what we owe, you know, like that's what I think we bring to, um, to you know, this work. Um, because, you know, I, I think back to the number of times that I had um, medical student classmates who, you know, had to keep it to themselves that they were gay, who had to keep it to themselves that they were, you know, undocumented. And I think that, you know, the only way that those, those uh, aspects of our identity and who we are and what we do change is when we hold each other, you know, close enough in, in our hearts and our work that we are willing to, you know, you know, take risk with you and not just let it be that, you know, we pat you on the back when you come back from doing something courageous. Um, Steve, I see your hand raised. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat and... Uh, 
about this. Uh, uh, we actually do need to move forward into the panel. Thank you so much. For oh, your okay. Um, is there anything final that you wanted to say before we move forward? Um, no, I, you know, I really just uh, thank everyone for um, this opportunity and, um, you know, I'm excited to work with you um, now and in the future. And, um, and, and thank you so much to the organizers of this conference for finding a way out of no way. That's fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Saram, for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, now we're going to move forward to our panel, which will focus on advocacy work in the next normal of COVID-19. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Bill Jordan, who's been a great help to the AIM since its inception three years ago. He's been with us the entire time. Dr. Jordan currently works in the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness at the NYC Department of Family and Social Medicine. And, the, and is the founding director of the Preventative Medicine Residency at Montefiore Einstein, a founding organizer of NY Docs Coalition, board chair of the National Physicians Alliance, and co-chair of the Policy and Legislative Committee of the Public Health Association of NYC. And now I'm gonna pass the mic to Ann Palladino, who will start by introducing um, our panelists. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ann Palladino. I'm an M2 at Wall Cornell. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce first our patient uh, panelist, Allison Yeagle. Allison is a patient I knew from back home in New Hampshire. She was first diagnosed in 2005 with stage one breast cancer. And then in 2011, again, presented with metastases. And since then she's been treated with uh, hormonal therapies and various drug trials. She has spoken about her experience as a patient to crowds many times and is a wonderful advocate for patient care and her community in general. Um, and then I also have the honor of introducing uh, Crystal Tsosi, who is um, an inspiration and a personal role model for me. Uh, she is a co-PI at Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa where she, um, and she is also working towards her PhD at Vanderbilt in genomics and health disparity. Her research looks at the, the um, genetic determinants of preeclampsia in pregnant o Ojibwe women. Um, and she has also done some really great advocacy work, most notably organizing an online conference called Decolonize DNA Day on uh, Twitter, which drew more than a thousand participants. Um, and I will um, hand off the mic to um, the people introducing our next speakers. I'm um, sorry, I, yeah, Stephanie. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Cardona. I'm a second year medical student at SUNY Downstate and I'll be introducing Dr. Kamini Dubey. Dr. Kamini Dubey is a fourth year emergency medicine resident at NYU Bellevue Hospital Center, as well as the founder and organizer of the New York City Coalition to Dismantle Racism in the Health System, which is an action-oriented advocacy and policy-based collective of more than 40 member organizations and 1,000 members whose mission is to identify and dismantle the many forms of racism in the health system. She is also on the New York City Department of Health Narrative Power Network Planning Committee, and has received numerous awards, including four city council and state senate citations. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dubai. And good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Morenci. I am a first year medical student at the CUNY School of Medicine. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Augie Lindmark. Dr. Augie Lindmark seeks to understand why some people have health care, why some don't, and who gets to decide. Augie earned his medical degree from the University of Minnesota and completed an Oriema Fellowship in social medicine, where his research and writing focus on socio-political roots of health, specifically health system structures and right to health movement. In the clinical setting, Augie is an internal medicine physician at Yale New Haven Hospital with a focus on primary care and HIV medicine. He is also a resident physician in the Yale Primary Care Program. 
Augie has been featured on various media outlets, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, Pacific Standard, and The Correspondent, among others. His passion for storytelling and narrative medicine has appeared on multiple platforms, including Wordsprout and The Moth. He continues to write on the topics of public health, health inequities, and the role of organizing in medicine. Thank you to our committee members for introducing our wonderful panel. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jordan to begin our panel discussion. Thank you, Shane. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with everyone today. Again, I'm Bill Jordan. I'm a family doctor. Uh, my day job is at the city health department. I may make some comments that are my own opinion and not those of my employer along the lines of what Sanjeev said earlier. Um, and I just want to thank the students um, for leading this effort and uh, the academy for their support uh, during this historical moment um, to really continue this work is so important. And I'm really humbled to be here with all of you today, including our esteemed panelists. Um, I know we're going to focus uh, a lot on um, social justice issues and the current COVID pandemic. Um, I've definitely been uh, affected by this in my in my day job. You know, my neighbor uh, goes to work every day at Elmhurst. Um, we, you know, lost one of my son's uh, classmates, public school classmates, parents um, over the course of the pandemic. So I know this has affected all of us in different ways, and it's been inspiring in the few times that I've um, been out in the streets uh, outside of work to really see um, people mobilizing um, for racial justice and health equity. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna open up some <coughs> initial questions for our panelists. Um, they're gonna be pretty broad, uh, so we'll, um, we'll uh, let things flow. So um, I'll start by asking our panelists, how do you think the COVID pandemic you know, will impact the delivery of healthcare and the practice of health advocacy? I can start. Hi, um, I'm Allison Yeagle, um, a patient. I um, thank you for uh, asking me, Anne, to be on this. I, I, I think it's just such an honor to be here. Um, I've done. Uh, I've been a patient of Anne's mom for um, a long time. She's an esteemed surgeon in um, Exeter, New Hampshire, and uh, and I can say that um, currently I am a patient in um, at the hospital uh, at MGH, uh, Mass General, um, and it was interesting because being a cancer patient, a current uh, patient. Uh, being part of COVID, I, I think you have a hard time um, stepping out just as a patient, but then stepping out as a patient within the pandemic just brings levels of anxiety that you didn't used to have, you, you, ha you already have anxiety, now you have even more. Um, but I have to say that this experience has, um, has made me even closer to my team. I think because they tried even harder to make sure that I felt comfortable. Um, they gave me uh, the options of visiting via Zoom, um, more frequent phone calls. Um, you know, uh, there are times I had to be down there, but the protocols were just top notch. I just felt very safe. Um, so my experience so far has been incredibly positive actually just I, I just believe my doctors the teams the nurses the clinicians just went out of their way to make sure that i felt even better almost like i feel even safer thank you thank you for that i know um telemedicine has been a key um you know adaptation during this time and uh, and it's been a challenge as it's been unevenly distributed both in terms of the institutions and the patients um, so it's great to hear that your caregivers were able to do that i was wondering if the other panelists wanted to weigh in on this one hi everybody good morning thank you so much for the invite uh thank you Anne, for my wonderful introduction and Likewise, I am also a fan of yours, so it's great to see you over Zoom. 
Um, and I do have to acknowledge that I am a non-physician, so um, I'm going to be speaking from my own personal experience and also what I've seen from the perspective of my community, which is the Dene Nation or the Navajo Nation, which as we know has had the highest incidence and prevalence rates of COVID even greater than New York and New Jersey combined for a greater portion of the pandemic. And thankfully, I do have to highlight that because we were able to exercise our own sovereignty and able to impose our own public health measures that we now have rates lower than the state, rest of the state of Arizona. So even though, <laughs> even though, um, and I really like to highlight that fact because especially in media, there's been this, um, this proclivity for um, giving a, a, um, a perspective of, of poverty and, an, and you know, I, the term poverty porn is, is used to describe um, how uh, disempowered supposedly our peoples are. But if anything, the Navajo Nation, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, which has now been in, embroiled in legal battles with the state of South Dakota, with its governor, uh, who's been trying to uh, forcibly lift those um, uh, um, curfews and roadblocks and other, you know, the other 572 plus federally recognized nations and the other unrecognized nations as well have shown that, you know, communities really do have the a power to be able to exert these types of health decisions for themselves. So I, I definitely want to come out the uh, gate stating that, but to but to address um, the, the concerns about telemedicine, um, this is an issue that is, is um, if anything, that the pandemic has really shown that we need to have a better uh, technological um, understanding of the barriers that exist for delivering virtual care to indigenous communities that are remote. And that's not just in healthcare, but also in education. Um, we're, we're talking about for just using the Navajo Nation, a state that's larger than several states combined. Um, in, in many cases, our land mass is huge. Um, the number of peoples that we do have is a quarter million or more of uh, sparsely in sparse remote areas. And, you know, the number of clinics that we have are generally located in the peripheries of, of the community. So, uh, if somebody, even in, in non-pandemic conditions, the ability for people to, to seek care is kind of attenuated. It requires maybe a two-hour drive one way just to see a, a, a physician. And whether or not they can even have see a physician in non-emergent situations is not always known. So, and, and on top of that, we don't really have internet infrastructures and, and Wi-Fi hubs and it's really hard to deliver um, these type of care. In addition to the fact that there are cultural concerns and language barriers, especially considering that COVID, at least initially to our understanding, you know, disproportionately affected our elders. And our elders are monolingual and speak only Denefizad or, or Navajo language. So we already have a huge issues with having um, uh, available numbers of translators. And then it's particularly during this pandemic era, it's been really hard. And just to highlight this, um, even the word COVID, you know, doesn't exist in our, in our language. Um, we, we made up a term which roughly translates to the big cough which, you know, as you can understand, is not a very specific definition. It could describe pneumonia, it could describe so many other upper respiratory illnesses. So um, there's just, if, you know, I wanna highlight the pros and the cons of, of the pandemic that we are having these issues come to forefront, that we are able to open up these dialogues that we know have known to exist for a long time. But we also need, also need to come up with ways to empower communities and ourselves to be able to um, to move forward and solving these issues because you know this is probably not going to be the first pandemic it'll probably be the first of many unfortunately and we just need to look forward for the future so thank you thank you for that i know definitely here in new york we um, have a lot of issues in terms of access to high-speed internet um, and there have been initiatives that have been getting off the ground in terms of expanding it to public housing as an example 
Um, and I really appreciate your comments around um, changing the dominant media narrative. It was nice to see a story in a mainstream paper like the Times about, I think it was the Apache um, and their ability to do very successful contact tracing that um, really put to shame a lot of the um, you know, comparable efforts. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to invite to see if uh, Augie or Kamini um, wanted to weigh in. Yeah, this is, this is Kamini here. Um, I think it's important to point out that, you know, our health system, not just in New York City, but especially beyond, um, is extremely segregated. It's, we have a multi-tiered, uh, for-profit health financing system. So when we talk about how COVID impacts this health system and healthcare delivery, I think it's important to point out that academic medicine, so many of the institutions that we're salaried by and we work for, we're training in, um, especially for many of you, um, are benefiting from uh, this system the way it is, right? So for many, many years, uh, we've been working for um, white supremacist organizations that place profit over people. And many of the communities that we took an oath to serve, specifically communities of color, are often treated as wastelands waiting to be saved. So when people can engage in research um, in these communities uh, to bolster their own reputations, to write papers, um, and to uplift their careers, that's exactly done. But when you know, many different advocacy organizations came together at the very onset of this pandemic and were calling for attention um, to specifically prioritize communities of color, knowing very well how this pandemic will play out. No different from Flint, no different from lead campaigns, no different from many other uh, public health emergencies. Uh, unfortunately, that advice was not taken seriously. So then we saw once again that uh, there were inequities, specifically um, marginalized communities of color were bearing the brunt of um, COVID inequities. And I think that now we're living in a world where we can't ignore what's happening over and over and over. So when Queens hospitals were struggling, patients were being discharged, family members of mine were being discharged without oxygen when uh, people were dying. And uh, one night I came home from the ICU, working in the ICU at NYU, to hear that my uncle in a Queens hospital, Jamaica hospital in Queens, could not be transferred to the ICU because there was a shortage of ICU nurses. Um, there were not ICU beds. And then four hours later, he passed away. Um, and this happened over and over and over. So I started having a, a cohort of patients in Queens that I, were fo I was following just because the healthcare system were constantly leaving patients out. So I think we need to first, before we talk about how COVID has changed the health system, acknowledge what the health system has been and what we've continued to allow as healthcare providers because we ourselves often profit from the system the way it is. Um, we often talk about rationing in uh, the COVID pandemic, specifically ventilators, ICU beds, ECMO, but we must recognize that we've been rationing care for hundreds of years, right? In a federally fatalistic way, our nation has allowed millions of people to go uninsured or underinsured. Um, we've allowed this because we treat health care not as a human right, uh, but as a commodity where people in my one of my hospitals can demand an MRI and obtain it, um, where I can get emails that a VIP patient is coming to my hospital and I should get them quickly upstairs. Whereas at the other hospital, public hospital I work for, patients often wait hours um, for lack of uh, care resources. Um, and we know we can do better. So we'll move on to advocacy and what this looks like beyond the pandemic. But the number one thing I can say is in terms of the change and how COVID has uh, changed healthcare delivery is really uh, uh, all of us healthcare advocates and ad activists really calling for a transformational change in culture, moving away from a very individualistic and capitalistic mindset. Um, to a more universal uh, mind mindset where we can all think beyond ourselves. So for all of you, you're doing something that 
many of our faculty members haven't done, right? You're dedicating time on a Sunday, prioritizing advocacy, prioritizing uh, amplifying the voices of your patients that are often unheard, ignored, sometimes wrongfully targeted. Um, and I think that, you know, as we move beyond to an advocacy space, um, Dr. Sriram already talked about how many of our institutions um, will silence our voice and we have to do this work outside of the clinical care space. But I actually call on you all to challenge your organizations and to rise above the status quo and to figure out the ways, and we'll talk about that, where we can hold our institutions accountable and hold the people above us accountable for taking care of patients. There should be no reason that in the New York Care, sorry, the CARES Act, uh, that NYU should receive $92 million while all of the H and H hospitals, public hospitals together receive $45 million. There's something deeply wrong about this. Separate is not equal and we cannot allow this to happen over and over and over. Sorry about that. Sorry for rambling a little bit, but we'll go on to advocacy later. Thanks guys. That's wonderful, Kamini. I, I definitely um, echo what you were saying, you know, the CARES Act and, and really having a formula that's based on Medicare and not Medicaid, for example, um, or indigent care, um, that these policy issues are really um, run deep and, and over the long term of the history of how healthcare has been delivered in the country. Um, and also that, um, you know, the impact at the state level in terms of funding and how that impacts on um, hospitals being able to operate, um, you know, with full staffing and full equipment has been um, long preceded the epidemic. And I've been a, very much in the thick of those conversations at the health department in terms of supporting health systems in my emergency role and um, and getting um, emergency equipment out to them. I think it raises serious questions about, um, you know, their uh, you know, closing hospitals, um, you know, in areas that have been hard hit uh, while we're, um, you know, waiting uh, on eggshells to see if a second wave is coming. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate all of your work around this. Um, I don't know if Augie wants to weigh in um, and then maybe we can shift to talking more about how COVID has affected health advocacy for all of you. Sure. Um, I guess first, uh, I'm Really excited to be here, and I don't know if I have much to add to, to that power dynamic, and that was uh, really comprehensive. It's um, fun to be with you here all today. Um, it, it's hard to imagine. I, I think um, Connie's point about like what what the system was before all this happened is is so important because I think those are the questions uh, and branch points that that we need to put pressure on coming uh, during this pandemic and, and coming out of this pandemic. Um, I mean, I think about when when this all started, the, the question that I kept fielding from patients was, um, where can I get tested? How much is it, it going to cost and, and what's covered? Uh, and I'll be honest, I had no good answers um, because we didn't have we didn't have a structure in place that uh, offered assurances and security to people asking a basic question of, of can I get health care? Um, I mean, if you look at, at some of the Gallup polling um, of who's avoiding care, like before this pandemic even started, 25% of people, 25% of people in, in the United States said, you know, either they themselves or a family member had delayed care due to cost for a serious medical illness. Um, and then when COVID hit, you had 14% uh, of people saying, yep, I wouldn't go to the clinic. I wouldn't go to the hospital, even if I had uh, symptoms of COVID. Um, and if you made under, I think it was $40,000 uh, a year for an annual income, or if you were from a community of color, that uh, that rate went up to over 20% of people who said they just weren't going to access uh, a healthcare system, um, even if there was a, a high chance that, that they had COVID-19. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, as we look back this week, uh, as uh, Chris Christie may or may not have uh, electively admitted himself to the hospital, I'm not exactly sure of all the details about that, um, but we don't just have a two-tiered system. We have hundreds of, of tiers, and, and depending who you are, um, uh, who, uh, how much money you make each year, um, really uh, delegates whether or not you're going to have a positive outcome, COVID or otherwise. Um, so I, maybe I'll just leave it there and we can um, kind of talk more about advocacy, but um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate um, those additions in terms of laying out the complexity of the 
current healthcare system and how that kind of really is a uphill um, fight for many of our patients um, and unnecessarily so. Um, with that, I really um, will try to transition us to talking about, you know, how has this pandemic or, you know, all the events that have occurred during the pandemic, not just COVID itself, um, uh, but the, you know, increasing, um, you know, media attention to issues of racial equity. How has that shaped the way that you view health advocacy and how has it, how has it impacted your advocacy work? Um, and in particular, if you can point to some positive uh, ways forward. I think we just have a really humble panel where everybody just wants everybody else to speak first. Um, so I'll try to keep it short uh, as best as possible. And I think this ties a little bit to one of the questions in the chat as well. Um, but I think that, you know, within academic medicine, we often look within academic medicine for answers, right? So a, a lot of times we don't recognize how our research methodology may be flawed and may end up perpetuating inequities um, instead of getting at the root causes of problems. So we continue to look within academic medicine. And I think that, you know, now more than ever, we need to look outside of our hospitals and outside of academia for answers. Um, so Kay Bain, who is one of the best organizers um, of our time, I think, um, part of Cure Violence, does a lot of violence work himself. He often says, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. It seems very simple. Um, but I think that we have to look toward uh, community organizers, patients. Our patients know their bodies best and they know their communities best. And I think that um, for a very long time within academic medicine, we have neglected to learn the histories of our community. So we played a bl blind eye to scientific racism and long history of scientific abuse, abuse of black and brown bodies um, specifically. And uh, that hidden curriculum should not be hidden because it influences uh, the patients uh, that we care for and the type of care we provide. So we would never pre uh, present a patient to our preceptor without their history of present illness, right? You would never say 52 year old man uh, coming in with heart disease. It's important to know that that person has vascular or cardiovascular risk factors. Similarly, uh, we cannot continue to treat our patients outside the context of the history of their communities. It's important to know the, the segregation, the racism that they often face, um, the police brutality and excessive use of force that constantly influences their daily lives. So I think that, you know, as you all are doing today, bringing uh, patients into our spaces, we need to recognize all those that don't make it to our doors and the reasons why. So part of advocacy is really not just talking, talking, and talking and giving ourselves a platform. COVID has really seen, uh, I, I don't mean to be um, critical, but COVID has really seen a number of doctors making careers off of Twitter and sitting within ivory towers and within their households and tweeting and tweeting and tweeting. And that's, that's great because it does educate and it, do, it does allow to uh, shedding awareness on key problems. But I think a lot of us have to leave our institution knock on doors within our communities and learn about what people are going through on a daily basis. There's street medicine now where we talk to our undomiciled patients, recognize their problem, learn from them, take the strategies of community, organize them and bring them within our hospital. So one of the things that we're doing in terms of the uh, coalition is an advocacy which has been uh, going on before COVID, but now during COVID as well, is talking to our institutions about segregated care and what, what are the barriers to resistance in terms of accepting patients with Medicaid to a lot of our academic specialty centers. The fragmentation and keeping us in isolated silos is exactly what our institutions want to do. So part of that is really amplifying patient voices, having town halls, sponsoring town halls where we really get as many patients as possible. Right now, virtually, it's a little bit harder, but to 
share their stories, share the narratives. And then um, I think that, you know, it's hard for our institutions to really um, get at one person or target one person. But when we come together, there's strength in numbers, right? No trainee can do this work alone. No medical student can do this work alone. But when you have hundreds of medical students coming together and residents coming together along with junior faculty, and then we also add in or amplify our patient voices with town halls, petitions, we actually get somewhere because that is a lot of not just internal pressure within the organization, but external pressure. The last thing an organization wants is a media piece calling out segregated care of their institution. And I'm not saying we have to go straight to media, but if you keep giving these organizations many different opportunities to change with behind the door conversations, then there has to be a point where we, we uh, really hold them to the communities they're hoping to serve and then amplify these voices. So I think there's something very powerful about internal pressure as well as external pressure. Um, and all of you can do this together. But if you do it alone, that's where you're sort of um, exposing yourself um, to be targeted in terms of the future and by the organization. But they want, they want to you know, know that there are many, they don't want that actually, they, but they will respond when groups of people come together. Thank you for that, Kamini. I definitely, um, I'm still faculty at Einstein and I remember when I was working there full time um, that I was really inspired by the students who organized um, around the death of Eric Garner and really forced the institution to um, change their training and bring things like implicit bias training into the um, first year orientation and move a community tour that had been during the family medicine clerkship in third year into the first year orientation so that students could really get to know the communities that they were um, joining and serving. So I really appreciate all the examples that you gave. Um, hoping others can weigh in on this. Hi everyone. Um, my my actual interest in, in genomics is actually about indigenous data sovereignties and examining how current genomic technologies um, are effectively repeating the same uh, colonialism of the past. And in the past, indigenous biomarkers have been collected uh, from disempowered individuals without sovereignty in Central and South America and in vampire projects, as they were called, which were like, for instance, the Human Genome Diversity Project, the 1000 Genomes Projects, and in which um, researchers would come into remote indigenous communities in using broad consent language, most likely in English, which is not even a language that many Native people speak, collect blood, promising um, innovations in, in medicine and leaving and providing this information on uh, like to be openly available for the benefit largely of other people while at the same time ignoring their original promise that they gave to the people that actually contributed the material and now like for instance there's this this is really born into a real biocolonialist biopiracy um, uh, reality in that the companies like 23andMe and Ancestry DNA and several clinical tests, testing companies have utilized those biomarkers to create genomic technologies to study diseases that don't even affect Native people and at billions of dollars of profit per holiday quarter. Um, that's like one of the popular gifts of the last couple of years was for 99 or 79 dollars, you know, purchase this genetic ancestry kit and determine how what percentage Native American you are. And meanwhile, also coercing displaced Native American individuals um, with the false reality of their of the scientific validity of their test to actually become paid guinea pig, paying guinea pigs to provide more and more future information. And as we know, data is is a is is one of the global movers in our, in our global economy. It, it's worth a lot of money. And the 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 way that data is being collectivized is blurring the lines between public health and research. And that these were issues that existed before COVID. And that these were issues that are being uh, were being um, born 
revisiting these same issues of the past, but being born in new ways, for instance, in large scale precision medicine initiatives. And now what we're seeing in indigenous communities, especially with COVID, is a possible a grab for finding new biomarkers and collecting new information. And, and this is where I caution that inclusion, like mere inclusion is not enough because what that ends up doing is just repeating the same extractivism of the past and just merely just asking for people to contribute their data in biological or, or health informations or not is, is, is we have to ensure that the benefits actually go back to those communities. And we're seeing this in, in vaccine trials and we're seeing this being pushed by a larger national agenda to um, include Native American peoples in vaccine trials, when in reality, there's really no evidence to show that there's a biological predisposition for COVID that exists outside of structural inequities to health. And yet this is the message that's being given to tribal leaders to coerce tribal participants to participate in trials, possibly by, um, you know, strong armed uh, tactics by stating that, oh, your people are at health, you, you are going to further damage the health of your future, um, of, uh, your, of your community by lack of engagement in these technologies. However, you know, we, we have to question what, why are Native peoples being targeted for vaccine trials? And uh, unfortunately, in my, and this is my cynical point of view as somebody who's seen the, the field of genomics and other bio, biological markers being usurped in these ways, is it's largely for um, the PR of it to increase the stock price. And whether or not it's actually going to be a benefit, a specific benefit for Native Americans is going to be of question. And, and I use this as just an example of, of, of a whole bunch of other uh, new uh, med medical initiatives is that we can't just talk about, oh, we need to increase the numbers of underrepresented populations because, oh, if you don't, minority people, then you're at fault. Like, no, the system needs to change to understand why minority people and minority communities haven't participated willfully and understand what, what those problems are and correct them first before asking for our DNA and our data. And, and honestly, and this is me as a geneticist saying, not all problems are biologically mediated. A huge number of heritability is unknown and is probably more related to uh, socioeconomic factors than actual uh, biological predisposition. And that is the question that I want to see in, in the future. And if anything, what I'm really hoping for is that by highlighting these uh, structural inequities due to racism, uh, highlighting the fact that there are inadequacies in our healthcare delivery systems that are drawn down the lines of white versus brown versus black, that hopefully we can draw more attention to the real issues that relate to health disparities, not necessarily the fact that everything is biological. I'm so grateful for that, Crystal. I, I see like in the most recent media coverage, uh, like this desperate attempt to always um, find a biological underpinning to outdated, um, you know, conceptions of race, like with the Neanderthal uh, genes being the latest example that I've seen all over the media. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Allison and, and Augie. Yeah, I, I think the, um, Crystal's comments about uh, exploitation, I kind of rings ubiquitously uh, across this COVID pandemic. And I think and like her points are kind of the most urgent and crucial that that need to be addressed of of anything that's that's going to be said here today. Um, I, th I think the exploitation, it you know, uh, that I saw is that the the line between essential workers and expendable workers became very very thin, um, and there was this widespread experience of exploitation by a number of people who perhaps hadn't experienced it in a very long time, um, and. I, it, the particular communities I think of are, are physicians and and healthcare workers. That there was this blurring of the lines of of who uh, who is expendable uh, in this system, 
um, and who is is going to be uh, exploited um, based on based on responses to to COVID. Um, I think the that's it's a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity. I think. Um, as Camille was saying that, you know, academic medicine has a very hard time of even naming things, has a very hard time of naming racism, has a very hard time of naming runaway capitalism um, as causes that are that are fueling this pandemic. Um, but I think there's, you know, the the hope and, and I think the optimism that 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 I see is, you know, there's this scope of, of communities expanding, especially uh, in, in people who are from communities of privilege. Um, Doctors are healthcare workers. Doctors have not always acted like healthcare workers. Um, there's many reasons for that. There's, uh, you know, a number of privileges and, and insulations of the soundproof, very thick walls of the halls of academic medicine that uh, end up uh, insulating people from the lived experiences of, of what's happening in, in patient communities. Um, I think there's, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people are, are having to, to face the question and especially academic uh, medicine having to answer the question after uh, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor is the, the question is, you know, where have we been all this time? Um, and, and having a, a very hard look at uh, where we have been and where, where we are going um, in order to uh, leverage the privileges that come with uh, communities of, of health professionals to, to kind of redirect uh, our country and, and, and our health systems. Um, I think the, the hard part is that we'll kind of have to um, think about is, you know, this is really hard work uh, being distant and advocacy right now is like the lifeblood is community and, and people. And I think even just being here on this call with you all is, is kind of a, a, a re-energizing of, of a, a very real fatigue that, that has come with, with trying to push up against uh, long-standing systems um, that have perpetuated inequities in, in COVID this year. Um, I think if there's any students for a national health program folks in the audience, it's like I remember in med school organizing with, with folks that I probably never, that I still haven't met in person. And I think that gives me hope that it's possible. There's so many internet friends and, and people that you don't necessarily interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's, there's value in, in, in making sure that, um, you know, people can, can take a break. <laughs> people can, um, and, and provide self-care as, as uh, was mentioned earlier in the day. So. Great, thank you. I'll give the last word on this question to Allison, and then I'm gonna invite my colleagues, uh, Shane and Marcia, to um, bring us some questions from the audience. Hi, I um I don't think I can add much more to um, everyone has been so eloquent and so um, energetic on this as a patient. You know, I can only speak from my experiences, um, and so I. I, I think what's different for me than most patients is being on a trial for the past four years. Um, I have a different level of care, I think, um, than if I were not on a trial and if I was just a regular patient going in um, uh, for just normal, I would say, I, I call it normal care. But um, so I see, so I, I work just with clinical trial and clinicians um, who are, are doing a lot of research. And so I'm constantly, I, I, I feel like I'm almost over cared for, you know, just because I'm being constantly asked questions, constantly interviewed, constantly called, you know. Um, and so I, I, I understand the injustices or I see the injustices across the, the healthcare field, um, but I, I I'm not experiencing them because I'm in this sort of bubble of research, I think. So I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have much to add on this. Um, so. Much appreciated. I think a lot of, um, a lot of what we've been talking about is, uh, you know, healthcare workers and advocates really um, needing to um, put the voices of patients first. So I really appreciate you being here and sharing your experience with us. Um, so with that, I I, um, I want to try to keep us um, roughly on schedule. So I'm going to invite um, Shane and Marcia to weigh in with questions that have been popping up uh, in the question box. 
Um, so one big question uh, that came up um, is that um, some or a few people have asked, how can we hold our institutions and those above us accountable in a way that protects us as vulnerable medical students in a safer way? And one of the examples that was brought up was that um, to the persons, well, whoever asked the question, to the person's under, understanding, uh, students and residents at NYU were explicitly threatened uh, with not getting references or support for the match, fellowship, fellowship or jobs um, regarding some of their activist work. I, I think there's some elements of, of identifying who, uh, who, who in your organizing community is more at risk than other people um, and recognizing uh, that we carry a number of privileges in our organizing communities and, and who, who, who uh, can, can face a, a little bit more pressure from, from larger organizations. The, the, the other piece I'll say is there, there are organizing groups with immense amount of of power and and I think uh, medical students and we've seen this with with residents especially who oftentimes aren't aren't unionized partnering with unions and and partnering with people who have some leverage and have legal support that that trainees perhaps don't have and I think that's kind of one of the the, the largest lessons I've learned as a resident physician I've always valued labor rights and it was not until starting residency that I realized oh I need labor rights um, and I, I think there's, there's also something to say of, of people who are perhaps organizing on, on different topics as, as you are to get a larger cohort, because a larger cohort, if you don't have, if you don't have people, or if you don't have power, sorry, if you don't have money or if you don't have power, you can get people uh, and that can kind of be a placeholder. Um, I think there's been a groundswell of, of people who previously perhaps weren't involved in direct actions and advocacy that have now been in those roles in COVID. I think of people arguing and, and moving for hazard pay and PPE, which are all great. It's wonderful. But I also was like, where, where, where were you? And, and where were we, where was our coordination um, years ago before all this happened? And, it, and it's a, it's a great opportunity. And I, I think kind of uh, rallying people who, and, and making the connections that there is this parallel story of, of what we're fighting for, um, such that when you sign those letters and you're getting those threats from the institutions that there's much more people listening uh, when those threats are coming out. Um, and you have much more supports from, from a legal standpoint and a media standpoint to protect you. That said, um, totally here that there are times when you just can't associate your name with the words that you say because uh, there are people who can, who, who, who can uh, harm you. Just to echo that point, I would say, um, you know, there's a recent study that came out around um, long-term care, nursing homes, and um, the outcomes of uh, where the staff were unionized versus where they weren't and how the health outcomes were better um, in the unionized places. And Kamini had a comment. Yeah, I very much agree with the points said there. And, and overall, I mean, you all know this, but I think that, you know, humility and love truly are the core of activism in general. And um, a lot of times we can get really gung ho and we can think that our point is the best point, the way we organize is truly the only way. And uh, we learned that that's not the case, right? There are so many ways to organize. And I think if we view someone, the CEO of our hospital, the chair of our department, whoever it is, um, the, the DOH commissioner, um, as solely a source of resistance and nothing else, then we'll never understand that person's perspective and why they're doing what they're doing, right? We all uh, are employed by very, very problematic institutions, and it's very hard to maintain our identities um, in some of these places, right? It's, it's hard to have a voice outside of the institution. So I think it's important to be as humble and respectful as possible when trying to advocate for our patients to learn the other person's point of view. And if you feel like you're doing that and you're doing this with, you know, in terms of strength and numbers um, and you're really not getting far, I think it's important to, to reach out to your mentors, the people you trust, right? There are many people within our organizations that can have our back and fully support us. And it's important to know who those allies are. Uh, many of the senior faculty members who may have tenure and more protection, um, some of the junior faculty members who are just very much interested in 
supporting you. So during, uh, over the course of COVID, there have been quite a few instances of uh, retaliation at some of the large academic medical institutions without going into too much detail. One of the things I've done is reached out to uh, some of the more senior faculty members who have lots of protection or more protection than, than others at our institution. And I've said, listen, this has happened to a medical student. Um, now is the time to write a letter in support of that medical student. Now is the time to show your support in a meaningful way. Many of the medical students are now applying for residency. And because they've really just tried to advocate for their patients, they're now in this position where they're uncertain about their future. And that should never be the case. So residents have come together and have written letters in support. Once again, if more and more pockets of people within an institution are standing up together in support of patients, you really can't turn that uh, person down and, and single out one person to retaliate against them. So I would just say, listen, you're not doing this work alone ever, right? You may think you are, and it could be extremely isolating, and they benefit from fragmentation. So just maintain your humility, learn who your allies are, and all of the people right now who are on Twitter and who are very vocal, those are the people to reach out to. Say, listen, I am very scared about the future. I really want to continue my adv advocacy work. Please, can you um, help me engage in advocacy together? And people will not say no, if, even if it's out of guilt they won't say no. And then that's the point That's the um, point where you can form a coalition, build relationships, and then hold the institution accountable. Thank you. Crystal or Allison, do you wanna weigh in? Allison, do you wanna go first? Okay, I guess I'll just go. Um, I'm probably the worst in some ways person to ask this because I am a somewhat publicly visible graduate student um, online, but I'm also the only Native American graduate student at my institution. And my institution is also the PI institution for one of the um, medical initiatives I just, you know, lightly uh, uh, lambasted a few moments ago. Uh, <laughs> so, but the way that I protect myself is, it, it's, it's not great, honestly, because graduate students are empowered when they're unionized, but when you don't have a grad student union, you're largely on your own um, and you are reliant on your mentors to be your protectors, but sometimes they're not always in a place themselves that they can always advocate for you because they have to work with their own politics. So uh, my advice is, um, you know, anonymized op-ed pieces are always powerful. Um, and I've seen a number of those in both the scientific literature, peer-reviewed literature, and also in some of the major news outlets that have come from students and academic researchers that have purposefully um, left their identities uh, confidential. And those are really great tools. Um, but in terms of your day-to-day -day communications, uh, when, you're, when you're speaking with university um, administrators and you think that you might be at risk of, of jeopardizing your university position, my, my, my suggestions are always get everything in writing, um, email trails, uh, forward emails to your another um, personal inbox so that if they cut your uh, access to your university email address, you have a documented record. Um, avoid in-person meetings that unless you can have somebody with you who is your advocate to serve as a third person witness and take notes. Take, it maybe it's in many states, it's illegal to record conversations, maybe all of them. I, I don't quite know. I'm not a legal person in that respect. But um, with every single interaction that you have with people, um, key individuals that you might think might have um, used the conversation against you in the future, document date, time, type of interaction, and a summary of what was stated. And just keep it handwritten in your own personal 
Um, don't leave it in your lab. Don't leave it in your, in your personal office or university space. Keep it in your personal space off campus or outside of your institution. Because if they lock the doors on you one day and decide to uh, stop access to your email, you want to have access to those personal records. Um, and that may not be the best advice, but at least it, you, as much as you can, control the narrative. That's all I can say. Thank you so much, Crystal, I, um, for all those practical tips. I definitely agree, um, you know, and I'm in a public service job and I do advocacy outside of work. Um, and so I also think about things like logging out, you know, before I'm writing things, because, you know, some of the software is, you know, recording what you're doing in other pieces of software. It gets, you know, not to be overly paranoid, but there's, there's a lot of different ways of protecting yourself. Um, and you know, writing things collectively with others, as people have mentioned, where your name might not need to be on the piece and can provide some level of protection. Um, I'm so grateful for that. Um, I'm going to just check if Allison has any final comments to add, and um, otherwise we're going to wrap up for the um, segment. No, thank you so much for having me. And like I said, it was incredibly informative and interesting, and I appreciate um, Anne asking me to participate to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just so wanted to say, if I, um, just, I oh, just yeah, sure. to add just one small point. Um, and that is, is that there are times when your hospital has like community engagement as a priority for something, marketing, PR, whatever. Um, knowing how to be clever in your engagement with that so that you are kind of helping them accomplish something that is a priority for them, but maybe bring them gently to the work that you are doing. Um, it's, it's delicate, it's tricky. Um, you have to kind of think about like, you know, being Princess Leia working with Han Solo and Lando Calrissian, right? Like, these are not great, you know, these are pirates, these are gamblers, these are like, you know, some people who've got their own agendas, but knowing how to bring them into the rebellion, like, you know, safely so that you are protecting people is, it can work. It's just that you've got to be clever. You've got to know how to like bring your R2 unit with you and, um, and you know, like, and, and, and watch your back and be smart about it, but it could work. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, that's a great way to wrap up. I'm just so grateful for all the panelists for being with us today. And thank you to the audience for all of your um, questions. I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. Um, and just a quick announcement, because I forgot at the top, um, you might be wondering why I'm moderating the panel today, because I'm not on the agenda. Um, my colleague, Dr. Torian Easterling, uh, was recently promoted to be the first ever um, chief equity officer of the New York City Health Department. Um, which is a new position. And um, so, of course, he's um, even more than ever pulled into unexpected meetings with the mayor and others, um, and which happened this morning. So I am a last minute um, fill in. So I just wanted to thank all of you um, again for being here today and for being with us. And with that, I will hand off to my colleague um, to announce the short break we'll have before going into the workshops. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to our moderator and our panelists. I just wanted to say that we'll be taking a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 1255. If anyone has any questions or any more comments they would like to make, feel free to put them in the chat.
Hello? Hello?
Um, hello, everyone. We will be transitioning into our workshops now. Thank you. Hi everyone, <clears throat> apologies on delay. Just want to let you know that we're still uh, getting people into the groups and uh, I might just take a few more minutes.
Hi, so sorry for the delay. Um, they're still working on it. The IT team is still working on it, and hopefully soon uh, we'll have the breakout room sorted. This is Michael from IT. Everybody's in a room. If you're in the wrong room, can you chat and I'll move you to the right room? Hi, Michael. This is still the main um, main uh, Zoom call. Uh, I actually got sent the wrong room. I'm not sure if that happened for other people as well. I got sent to the policies, pandemics, and public health. It's supposed to be in the, um, the virulence of systemic inequality uh, breakout session. Okay, hold on. If you could, if you could chat, what room? I'll be glad to move whoever. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a printer here where I am right now, so. I don't see anybody else. Um, I have been assigned to the uh, COVID-19 and the virulence of system room. I, I should be in, the, I believe, the trauma room. Yeah, yes. He's also one of the facilitators. So if you can move him uh, first, that would be great. Hi, Michael. Did you did you copy copy that what Sean was saying? Say it again, please. We need to move the, one of the facilitators first. Sean, do you want to tell the name and please? Arturo Holmes. Uh, he's one of the facilitators for the trauma uh, breakout session, and um, uh, Mia, Mia. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also one of the facilitators. I still need to get into the room. Wait, one at a time, please. Uh, Mr. Holmes should be in the rep reproductive justice room. No, I, I should be in the, uh, I believe it's the trauma room. Okay, you're in, okay, that's been done. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, who else was in the wrong room? I'm, I apologize. Uh, Meow, Jenny, Hua. Uh, I should be in the policies, pandemic, and public health room. Jenny, Hua. And which room are you in now? I, I'm in the main room. I don't know. I was sent to a room, I, uh, and then I came back, but I'm not sure which room I was sent to. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not even seeing you. Hold on. Um, Last name is spelled H-U-A. I'm not even seeing you. Michael, her last name, it's her first name is M-I-A-O. Middle name is Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y. And the last name is H-U-A. She's a facilitator, so she needs to be there. I'm sorry, Jenny, what room again? I apologize. Oh, I can't move you from here. Uh, policies, pandemics, and public health. It's not letting me move you. I wonder if I take. Oh, no, I can't do that. Can you try leaving and coming back really quick to see if that resets what what he's having trouble with? 
Yeah, do you, should, should I just call back into the Zoom? I can leave the meeting right now. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, and I, I think the other people are participants. If you could get them into their rooms as well, that'd be great. Um, See, here's the weird part. As far as my, you know, my panel goes, everybody's in a room. Oh, okay. So the thing is, on my screen, I was sent to the wrong room, which is what happened to Mia. M Mia. All right, Mia, where should Mia go again? I'm sorry, I finally can move her. Policies, pandemics, and public health. Okay, she's she should be there now. Thank you. Okay, who else is in in the right room? Um, let's see. Leanne um, and Jolly and Anessa or Nisa, I'm sorry if I pronounced your names wrong. Do you know what rooms, uh, what, what your first choice was so we could get you there? They may have to log in and log back out. I can't move them. Okay, so I would have to do the same thing then. So I'm gonna yeah, I think so. <laughs> They might not be actively at their computer right now, but that might okay. be another thing. Um, so I'm gonna leave and come back so I could get put into the room. Okay, and what room do you go to? I'm supposed to be in the uh, um, COVID-19 and the virulence of systemic inequality. Okay, COVID-19, you got it, thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our second keynote, Dr. Joya Mukherjee. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the chief medical officer at Partners in Health, providing a preferential option for the poor in healthcare. She is an internist, a pediatrician, an infectious disease doctor, and public health specialist. Dr. Mukherjee has been supporting Partners in Health's efforts to provide high quality, comprehensive healthcare to the most vulnerable populations in partnership with local communities and health officials in numerous countries across the world. Dr. Mukherjee's clinical expertise includes HIV, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, mental health, Ebola, human resources for health, and strengthening health systems. She also teaches global health delivery, uh, social medicine, infectious disease, and human rights to medical trainees at a wide variety of US and international institutions. She has helped create training programs for Rwandan and Haitian physicians, as well as global health residencies and fellowships for US trainees at Harvard and other American universities. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Mukherjee. You're welcome. Okay, so um, thank you so much for having me and really looking forward to your questions. I know that you're meeting today around activism in medicine. And I, first of all, wanna say thank you for that. Um, I think in my view, medicine has always been a field that needed activism, but perhaps in the United States in our lifetime, it's never been more clear than right now. And so I'll just start by talking a little bit about my uh, work and how activism has played such a huge uh, role in my life and my work. Um, and that really, I fundamentally consider myself a practitioner of social medicine. So um, many places, they don't teach social medicine. And so people may be scratching their heads and say, what is social medicine? And social medicine is really a very important part of the foundation of modern Western medicine. Uh, Rudolf, Ver Rudolf Virchow, who's you know considered one of the fathers of modern medicine, many of you still use his pathology textbook, he actually was the person who talked about the social factors or social determinants being more important than the biologic. The social factors really leading to um, biologic illness. And in his famous study uh, in the 1800s, looking at 
um, an epidemic of typhus in Upper Silesia, which is now Germany, he looked at the deplorable housing conditions, water, sanitation, etc., and talked about how medicine is really politics, um, but at a different scale. And so when we look at what's happening today with the global pandemic uh, of COVID, we see that again, social medicine is at play. If this was just a biologic illness, we would not have the disparities that we do, the racial disparities, the social and economic disparities in who gets it and also who uh, has a more likely fatal outcome. And I think this is true throughout uh, the United States and indeed throughout the world. So if you look at the life expectancy in the United States versus the life expectancy in Sierra Leone, you might see a difference of 30 years. Uh, our life expectancy in the, in the high 70s and in Sierra Leone, it may be in the low 50s or high 40s. But similarly, in my city of Boston, if you take the orange line uh, subway, not like a good subway, like your subway, uh, between Roxbury Station, which is in a historically black neighborhood that has suffered from over-policing, mass incarceration, uh, redlining of housing, if you take the train from Roxbury Station to Back Bay Station, which is a quote unquote um, gentrified neighborhood, the life expectancy difference is 30 years as well. And that's 30 years for a six minute train ride in the same country. So how can we look at medicine, both the risk of dying, the suffering related to illness, and um, also just the outcomes and not become activists for social change. Um, and for me in my own work, as I mentioned, I grew up in this as part of the movement for HIV treatment access. I had been working in Africa. I had seen many people die of HIV in the years before antiretroviral therapy. But then we suddenly had this amazing cocktail of medicines that would save lives. And there was no movement to bring this to people in Africa or anywhere else in the world. And even in the United States, we were told not to prescribe these medicines to people who were using IV drugs or other people who quote unquote may not be adherent. And so in those quotes was unpacked a lifetime and generations of oppression. And so today, when we think of medicine, um, we are often really looking at biologic and what we say at Partners in Health and what we teach at Harvard is that medicine is a biosocial problem. It is the interaction between biologic, uh, our biology, the biology of, of microbes, et cetera, with the social determinants of health. So what are the social determinants of health? Well, there are things like water, sanitation, a fair living wage, a roof over your head, food security, but there are also political aspects like racism, like gender inequality, th that these political decisions that have been made. And so don't think when we use the term social determinants of health that these things are fixed. These are often created by policy. And just as they're created by policy, they can be changed by policy. And so I prefer to think of social determinants of health as social forces. And in my little bit of background as an engineer, we learned that a force was portrayed like a vector, like an, an arrow with a direction and a magnitude. And what we see in social forces, if we think of them as living forces, is they have a direction and a magnitude. When we think of our work as activists, as advocates for change, we want to understand that direction, understand the magnitude, and then push back against those very nefarious forces. So for example, as you know, in this COVID pandemic, 
testing has not been free. And there has been a lot of advocacy to expand testing, to have more access to testing, to have testing be more free, because if it's not free, then it will be disproportionately withheld from people who are poor, which because of the forces in this country is particularly people of color. And so as we look at the social forces of the just testing alone, then look at spread. We have communities like the one I explained to you, Roxbury, where in the 1950s, these communities were what we call redlined. In other words, they were a line was drawn around them to say they're not really mortgage worthy. Why were they not mortgage worthy? Because they were communities of color. They were communities that had suffered already from impoverishment. And that doubled down on the impoverishment by if you lived in a red line community, you couldn't get a mortgage. So what we have is communities where people don't own property and thus they are at the whims of landlords and overcrowded often. And so we have seen in these communities a much higher rate of COVID spread. So as we think of our activism, this is why social medicine is important. It's not not only act, being advocates for treatment, being advocates for prevention, but being advocates to change the policies that make people vulnerable, make them get sicker, and have worse health outcomes. And so as you look at any profession, so let's just say you want to be a neurosurgeon or you're a neurosurgeon, it matters if your patient is living under a bridge because they will get a shunt infection. Now it matters for many other things too, but with each and every illness that people may have, there are social forces that will mitigate their ability to, to prevent further illness and, and to get better. And so as I think of my life as a physician and an activist, if I want in our Hippocratic Oath, right, we wanna do the best possible for our patients and we want to do no harm and in many cases that will involve your advocacy so doing no harm might be keeping pay a patient in the hospital for longer because there's nowhere for them to go doing no harm may be trying to understand that without some kind of food support, people won't be able to quarantine or isolate properly. So in this social medicine vein, our organization Partners in Health has been asked to help learn and use these lessons of social medicine, even in Massachusetts as we face COVID, because we realize that the most vulnerable were people who were being threatened with eviction, who didn't have food. Um, and so it's not only telling people you are a contact, but what do you need to carry out this important information and then advocating for those people to have the resources they need. So Partners in Health works in 11 countries around the world, providing medical care, supporting the public provision of care. But since COVID, we're also working in cities and states around the United States to bring in this social medicine piece um, and assure that the most vulnerable are getting not only the information they need, but the material resources to do that. And then lastly, there's small advocacy, which we should always be doing for each and every patient and their family. And then there is large scale advocacy and in COVID, for us at Partners in Health, domestically, that has been uh, that has meant working on the Heroes Act, making sure that money is going for things like um, you know tenant relief, etc. Because we know these are not only social issues but health issues as well. So I think what I would say to you as you go forward in medicine and think of yourself as an advocate, look at the things you want to do, whatever you care about, whatever profession you go into, and try to understand the social forces, the direction, the cause, the magnitude of the social forces, and then how, what your role might be as a physician 
to mitigate those social forces for a patient, for their family, for the community, or nationally or internationally. And so to me, the difficult work that I've done in my life trying to mitigate AIDS, TB, Ebola, et cetera, it always makes me feel better to work on the bigger issues as well, because then you feel that at least you're making a person better and you're fighting for a more just world for all of us to live in. So I'll stop there. And I think we have some time for questions. Um, I know you mentioned um, trying to juggle, I guess, the like little advocacy and big advocacy, as you mentioned. Um, what it like, how do you kind of navigate or is it something that fluctuates on a day to day or year to be, year to year basis like those kinds of points because it, it's yeah. Yeah, thanks. Are you Marsha? Do I see your name properly? Yeah. yeah. So thank you. That's a great question. And I would say it does fluctuate day to day, but also where you are in your career. So interestingly, as a medical student, if you're a medical student or as a resident, um, you may be much more focused on individual patients. And that's great. I think some of the best advocacy, like personally, that I was able to do, for example, was in medical school, I was working in a juvenile detention, um, you know, center just doing pediatric exams, it was part of a, um, a rotation. And I was able to advocate for a young girl to get some additional mental health services. And it was really because I had the time as a student. Um, but today, you know, I don't spend as much time with individual patients and I have, um, you know, experience at a population level and I can do that. Um, so I think it depends on where you are in your career, what, what you're focusing on at the time. But then I also think it should be, you know, what you're passionate about. There are people that from the beginning, they know that they really want to be involved in advocacy and they may really take that on. I mean, there are physicians and um, other medical professionals in politics, for example, or working on policy from the beginning. I tend to think that continuing your patient care um, for some period of time is helpful because you know there's nothing that keeps us more honest than bearing witness to the suffering of others and so i think that i still even though i've been doing this work for you know over 20 years i still try to see patients on rounds um you know go on home visits and most of my work is overseas um because but but that sort of continuous reminding me of what matters is important. Thank you. Other, you're welcome. Other questions? I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Moving forward with COVID-19, um, there's not obviously a clear end in sight. And if anything, get worse in the US in few months. Um, one thing that I've been struggling with as a med student in my fourth year is figuring out ways that um, I can be can contribute to <laughs> what's going on, mm -hmm. um, like in terms of adv advocacy efforts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think all of us were at different levels of training. Some of us have been on clinical rotation, some of us have not. Where do you see medical students really being able to help in terms of mitigating the uh, like disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on these populations that you've been describing. Sorry, I'm just putting my jacket on. Um, I'm sitting outside, obviously. Um, that's a great uh, question, Alex. And I, I, first of all, I would say there is, there has not been a better time in my lifetime to just be an ally. And there are movements across the country whether it's Black Lives Matter, support for Black women, whether it's tenant rights campaigns, uh, fight for a higher 15 minimum wage. I think if you understand that this is all medicine 
if if you accept as i certainly do and i i'm radicalized more and more every year if you accept that all of these things are deeply rooted in suffering that we see and are and are changeable then you know and you have much more power than you think as a medical student right so i think you know i've been in, involved in you know some of the black lives matter protests here in in massachusetts and for a few of them, the, the organizers said, please, if anyone is a physician or a nurse, please wear your hospital uniform, right? So they wanted us to wear white coats, to, you know, so being helpful, being an ally, um, showing up, I think can be very effective. We also know that this election is critical and making phone calls um these are these are important things and again you know it, it's impossible to practice medicine right now in my opinion in an apolitical way and so um trying to figure out how we can change the dynamic we have a government that doesn't believe in science in the middle of a pandemic i mean even to the extent of our president falling ill and so I think trying to think about as citizens, what we can do, and then leveraging the power you have as a medical student. I know as a medical student, often we feel very powerless, but you're already considered smart, knowledgeable, um, for better or worse, <laughs> by many people and can, you know, use that as a way to help educate others. Um, and so I think there's a lot you can do in, you know, in run up to this election. I think there's a lot you can do in linking these social forces with life and death because they are really intimately tied to that. It's never actually been more easy than right now. I mean, it's still not easy, I get that. But, but there's so much going on. And I think you will learn, I mean, I look at it still as part of my education. When I show up to a protest, particularly one in which I'm an ally, I'm not an organizer, I'm an ally, I'm learning. I'm there as a learner. I'm there to help and, and, and be, you know, put my body in the movement, but I'm also there to learn how to be helpful, learn what the demands are. So think of it as part of your education. Hi, Dr. Mukherjee. Um, I just wanted to um, close out the session um, and um, yes, yeah, start the closing remarks. So my name is Anne Palladino. Um, I'm an M2, as I said, and it is my pleasure to be able to close out this conference. Um, it has been so inspirational to um, see you all here and to talk to everyone and as everyone has, our speakers and our panelists have um, so brilliantly shown, COVID has really thrown into relief all these inequities that have always been present, present in our society um, and have been going on and are often swept under the rug and really need to be addressed. Um, so I had personally gone into medicine because my mom had always told me to find a career where I could serve others and give back and be happy. Um, and I always knew that I could do that in medicine. I really think that our careers have such a great potential for doing good. They um, really do serve as an avenue for being able to give back. And we need to find ways to harvest, to harness this, uh, this privilege and power that we have to make these changes for our patients. And so, um, you know, medicine has always kind of had this idealistic goal of caring for others. But as we've heard, it has had a past that is filled with transgressions and neglect of other communities. Um, and, you know, we have seen very clearly again today that even at present, our system has health outcomes based on someone's perceived gender or race or disability or income um, and more. And so moving forward, we really need to make sure that we build a future that provides each patient 
the care that they need and deserve, regardless of these of these identities. Um, and again, as people have said, I really think that just by wanting to be here today, um, all of us have kind of shown this passion for change and have already started to think about how we can position ourselves to make these changes in our systems moving forward in our careers. Um, and so before we end, I just wanna thank everyone who's been involved in this today. So our panelists have done a wonderful job of showing us uh, how we can be innovative during these, during these times and still advocate for our patients. Our keynote speakers um, have been so wonderful about explaining the impact of political engagement and social medicine and healthcare. Uh, and our workshop leaders and partners have been really gracious in contributing their time. Um, I wanna thank our donors, including the CUNY School of Medicine and NIAM for supporting us financially, and especially NIAM, not only for their financial support, but also for hosting um, for hosting this conference, helping with the logistics, and really consistently having a um, passion for and belief in the importance of this event every year. Um, and lastly, I really want, wanted to thank uh, Marcia and Shane um, and all the other volunteers who have helped out. They're really amazing people. They have. Um, been dedicating their time to organizing all of this while they juggle medical school and all their other obligations. Um, and so it's been such a source of inspiration for me. I'm so glad that I got to work with them. Um, and finally, I just want to, um, to thank all of you for being here today. Um, it's, as I said, really great to see everyone being so passionate about um, you know, not only their medical practice, but really being there for their patients and showing up for them. Um, I want to remind everyone that we have a networking session right after this event. So um, feel free to grab some snacks and join us afterwards. And um, finally, I just want to say that I know we all have um, our own stories and reasons and motivations for being here today and for um, wanting to advocate for our patients. And so I just hope that you all hold on to these stories and use them to um, stay focused on the work we have ahead. And so thank you all once again for showing up um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, for whoever wants to stay on, we're going to um, put ourselves into breakout rooms for the virtual session. If you need to go, that's all right. Yeah, so um, I can just get started um, for, I, I think that the networking is for anyone. It's not just for students um, and it's the same link. So you all I can just stay on if you are uh, interested in participating. And the way it's going to work is um, we are going to break you out into um, into smaller rooms just so everyone kind of has a chance to speak. And then each round will kind of have some prompts for everyone to talk about. Obviously, you can talk about other things. Um, whatever you have in common. These are kind of just to get everyone started. Um, I'm gonna just pause the recording if that is okay. Yeah, okay, I'll just pause or PhD, uh, whatever program you're in. And the second prompt is to um, describe and share with each other one or two advocacy resources that you found useful. Um, it could be a publication, an organization or whatever. Um, it could be something you learned about today. And just so um, we can kind of all, all share some of these great resources that we've come across. And so, so Anne, how much time did you want for each, each group? Sorry, could we do like 10 minutes for each? Sure, absolutely.
Do we want to go back into groups? Yes, please. All right, I'm, I'm going to let the computer decide who goes into what room. Hopefully it'll work. It looks like it. Can you, um, I don't know if this would get, will get sent to everyone, but if not, can you, um, like, broadcast this or something to the group so they know what their prompts are? Yes. Sorry, I, I should have done oh, that before. No worries, you're fine. <laughs> Okay, how did the rooms look? Um, I'm trying to move everybody into two rooms because there's not that many people left. Mm. So right now I have most people in two or three. Okay. Um, for some reason, one or two people are not moved. Oh no, they moved. Yeah, so most people are in two and three. Um, Donna and Joey are showing up as not joined in four and five. Um, nobody's in room one. So. According to the computer, there's seven people in each room. Terrific. That's perfect. Yeah, Michael, I just decided to stay in the main room when I was okay, asked to go to the other room. Yeah. And do you know if they can see Anne's message in the breakout rooms? I don't know. Um, is, should, I sit, should I broadcast this? Yeah, if you can, that would be great. I'm going to try. It's from share one goal and that's yes. right. mm -hmm. I'm going to broadcast to all. Oops, that was brilliant. Okay, I just broadcast it to all. Perfect. Yes, I see it. Yeah. So hopefully one of everyone else does too. Clock. Set a timer. It's I think there is a way to record the rooms, so. though. But you have to do them locally to your computer. Uh, I don't think they really, you know, these are very informal discussions. Yeah, so I agree. I don't think they need to be, yeah. It wouldn't be something we would, you know, people would be interested in hearing, I don't think. Okay. All right, so you need a Zoom background for a Mac. Do you know if the Mac is fairly new, Donna? No, it's probably about um, two, two, two years or three years old. I'm gonna send you instructions. I know on the Mac I'm working on today, it does not work. Okay. But I have a brand new Mac I just bought that it definitely works. Ah, okay. So that's not, so <laughs> if, you, if, it does, if you have a brand new and it's the likelihood that I don't have it. Well, um, but yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send you the instructions. Thanks, Michael. And we could talk about it if you have a problem. Yeah, it's not that important. It's just rather than me worry about like what's what is behind me. No, I don't blame. <laughs> oh, am I still recording this? Oh, God. Okay, so while we wait for everyone to come back, I hope that everyone has really enjoyed their conference today. 
Um, I think we're gonna end now to respect everyone's time. Um, but, you know, feel free to like share emails and contact information with each other. Um, if you are interested in joining the work group or organizing next year's conference, you can um, maybe, yeah, just email Shane. Uh, he just put his Gmail in the, in the chat and you can just reach out to him about uh, joining for next year or for the upcoming work group. But we'll also be um, probably sending out an email to all the conference participants about this as well. So um, yeah, does anyone have any closing things they wanna say? Thanks, Anne. <laughs> Thank you all for like organizing everything. It's been such a wonderful experience. Uh, okay. oh, sorry. oh no, go, go for it. Yeah, go. No, I was just gonna say thanks everyone for attending and thanks to uh, um, everyone who organized stuff. You guys did great, great, great. Perfect. Have a great Sunday, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye.